June 1861. English philosopher John Locke declared in 1689, The natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth, and not to be under the will or legislative authority of man. This freedom from absolute arbitrary power is so necessary to and closely joined with the man's preservation that he cannot part with it. Whenever he finds the hardship of his slavery outweigh the value of his life, it is in his power, by resisting the will of his master, to draw on himself the death he desires. From early colonial times, fugitive slaves helped to move slavery from the shadows to the forefront of American life. Two letters of George Washington, written in 1786, provide the first reports of systematic efforts to aid and protect fugitive slaves. Runaway slaves were helped in an organized manner before 1830, but there was no widely recognized name for the activity. The Underground Railroad operated in the United States from late in the 18th century until the early years of the Civil War in the 1860s. It was a constantly changing informal network of secret routes and safe houses. Fugitive slaves passed, often at night, from border and southern states to Canada or a safe city in the north. Harriet Tubman became well-known during her years as a conductor of the Underground Railroad. She was a leading advocate for black freedom and social justice. When the Civil War erupted, she became an active participant in the struggle to defeat the South. In an 1893 letter, abolitionist Frederick Douglass revealed, My connection with the Underground Railroad began long before I left the South and was continued as long as slavery continued. I had as many as 11 fugitives under my roof at one time. In 1839, Theodore Dwight Weld, an abolitionist, published American Slavery as It Is, Testimony of a Thousand Witnesses. The book contains facts and testimony of slaveholders taken from newspapers published in slave states. The following appeared in the Florida Herald, June 23, 1838. Ran away from my plantation on Monday night, the 13th instant, a Negro fellow named Ben, as I have traced him out in several places in town, I am certain he is harbored. This notice is given that I am determined that whenever he is taken, to punish him till he informs me who has given him food and protection. A. Watson, June 16, 1838. A second volley in the abolitionist war against slavery was the 1854 publication of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. She used Weld's book as a source for the direct indictment of slavery. The book focused upon the breakup of slave families and the horror of slavery. Within a year, it sold 300,000 copies in the United States. It sold more than 10 million copies within the decade in the United States, making it the best seller of all time in proportion to population. Uncle Tom's Cabin caused an outcry in the South. Southern efforts to ban the book failed and copies sold so fast that booksellers could not keep up with demand. Within two years, pro-slavery writers responded with at least 15 novels which argued that slaves were better off than free workers in the North. The South's moral ground was seriously trampled by the increased debate surrounding Uncle Tom's Cabin. However, abolitionists were enraged and efforts began to secure repeal of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. An example of the uproar caused by Uncle Tom's Cabin is reflected by the August 1857 Maryland trial of Sam Green. He was tried on two counts, one for possession of abolition pamphlets, a map of Canada, and several schedules of routes to the north. The second count was having a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin in his house. Sam Green was acquitted on the first count, but found guilty on the second count and sentenced to the penitentiary for a term of 10 years. The following inscription is found on the Gateway to Freedom Memorial by African-American sculptor Ed Dwight in Detroit, Michigan. Until emancipation, Detroit and the Detroit River community served as the gateway to freedom for thousands of African-American people escaping enslavement. Detroit was one of the largest terminals of the Underground Railroad, a network of abolitionists aiding enslaved people seeking freedom. At first, Michigan was a destination for freedom seekers. But Canada became a safer sanctuary after slavery was abolished there in 1834. The successful operation of the Detroit Underground Railroad was due to the effort and cooperation of diverse groups of people, including people of African descent, 
whites, and North American Indians. This legacy of freedom is a vital part of Detroit and its history. <music>